Hello, Internet, and uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. My name is Kevin Bankston. Uh, I'm a fellow at Arizona State University Center for Science and Imagination, uh, which, if you're not familiar with it, brings together writers, artists, and other creative thinkers into collaboration with scientists, engineers, and technologists to reignite humanity's grand ambitions for innovation and discovery. I want to thank you for joining us today for our panel discussion on science fictional scenarios and strategic foresight. Uh, this is the third event in a series as part of CSI's Applied Sci-Fi Project. That project seeks to better understand the influence of science fiction on technology and the people who build it, to study the specific ways that sci-fi storytelling can be applied as a tool for innovation and foresight, and to better leverage that tool in service of creating more diverse and sustainable futures. Our first event, which you can find by Googling for the sci-fi feedback loop, was focused on the history of science fiction's influence on the course of tech development. Our second event was focused on the intersection of science fiction and design. And today's panel is focused on the relationship between science fiction and the field of strategic foresight. We have an amazing panel of practitioners in the realms of foresight and scenario planning and science fiction that I'll be interviewing today uh, as a panel. But first, we'll have some brief introductory remarks, dare I say, inspiring introductory remarks from another notable expert in this area, futurist Jane McGonigal. Uh, Jane is the New York Times bestselling author of Reality is Broken, Super Better, and most recently, Imaginable, How to See the Future Coming and Feel Ready for Anything, Even Things That Seem Impossible Today. She directs social simulations, future scenario clubs, story time for futurists, monthly signals of hope, scavenger hunts, and even more futures fun as the director of Urgent Optimists at the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto, which has been the premier nonprofit strategic foresight think tank in the nation since its founding in 1968. What is urgent optimism, you may ask? Hopefully Jane will tell us, but before she does, uh, just some very brief housekeeping. First, if you'd like to tweet about this event, which we'd love for you to do, we'd recommend the hashtag applied sci-fi. And if you have any questions, please use thanks. And, and now without further ado, Jane McGonigal. Thank you. Well, I only have five precious minutes today, so I want to jump right in by sharing with you two numbers from my research at the Institute for the Future that powerfully demonstrate why we urgently need a more optimistic science fiction and a more participatory futures imagination. Here are those two numbers. Since the start of the year 2020, there have been more than two and a half million English language news stories and headlines with the word unimaginable in them. And there have been more than three million news stories and headlines with the word unthinkable. Now we have all lived through these unimaginable events and unthinkable changes together from the pandemic to extreme weather and climate change, new social movements, shocking political events, a new war, an energy crisis. And the fact that these two words are so ubiquitous in the stories we tell, it reveals something important about our global condition. We are in a kind of state of collective shock. We have felt blindsided by events, but it's not just that we didn't see everything coming. There's also some grief and anger baked into these two words. We say, unimaginable to mean heartbreaking. We say unthinkable to mean unacceptable, unforgivable, unjust. And just to put these two numbers in perspective, these are some charts from a LexisNexis timeline search for the appearance of these two words in global news going all the way back to 1840 when nothing apparently was unthinkable or unimaginable to where we are today. And I'm really struck looking at these two charts of how they resemble the exponential surge of a virus. We have all been infected with this kind of failure of imagination or future shock. Are we just gonna have to white knuckle our way to the future and constantly stay vigilant for the next unthinkable change or unimaginable event? I don't think so. In my work at the Institute for the Future, we have demonstrated that through active participation in collective science fiction, collective social and future imagination, we can help people develop 
a mindset that we call urgent optimism, which is made up of three key psychological strengths and social strengths that we can nurture and develop. Mental flexibility, which is the belief that anything can become different in the future, even things that seem impossible to change today. Realistic hope, which means keeping a balance in our imagination of paying attention to new risks and emerging threats, but also purposely filling our minds with signals of change that are positive, new policy ideas, scientific breakthroughs, new demographic changes, just new ideas that could help us make a better future. And finally, future power, which is the sense of agency we can develop to actually help determine how the future turns out. And part of that means developing the patience to take action on the time scale of 10 years and beyond. So moving past short-termism to a more purposeful, long-term approach to our own lives and communities and organizations. Um, there are three questions that we use to help measure people's sense of urgent optimism around different topics. I'll share these three questions with you and you're welcome to use them in your own meetings and work and social media, wherever you want to ask people this, you can ask about any question. Um, they're all on a scale of one to 10. So on a scale of one to 10, when you think about the next 10 years of society or food or religion or art, do you think things will mostly stay the same and go on as normal? Or do you expect that we will dramatically rethink and reinvent how we live. One is almost everything stays the same. 10 is almost everything will be dramatically different. I like to partner people, lower numbers with higher numbers so they can talk about how they see the possibility for change. We also ask when you think about how society or food or religion or art might change over the next 10 years, are you mostly worried or mostly optimistic? One is extremely worried, 10 is extremely optimistic. Again, have people share their numbers and explain the reasons why. And finally, how much control or influence do you personally have to help determine how society or food or religion or learning or democracy changes for yourself and others over the next 10 years? One is almost no control or influence. 10 is almost complete control or influence. And here I like to ask people to free their mind and, and think wildly, what would need to change in your own life or society for you to at least plus one that number? What's one change that could happen or one new thing that could be true that would increase your number by at least plus one? I always say urgent optimism, it's not a fixed personality trait. It's something we can cultivate. It changes often throughout our lives, but it's also purposely changeable, which is why I run this group at the Institute for the Future. It's our first public membership program. It's called Urgent Optimist. And we do things, as Kevin said, like, have a monthly scenario club. It's like a book club, but we discuss different future scenarios. We go on signals of hope scavenger hunts where everybody collects at least one positive signal of change that gives us hope for the future. And next year we'll be starting our spend 10 days in the future series of social simulations. So for 30 days, you'll be invited to immerse yourself for 10 days at a time in a different science fiction scenario where you'll be answering the question, how would you feel? What would you do? And how would you help yourself and others? If you want to join us, come hang out at Urgent Optimist. Speaking of hanging out, I'll be hanging out for the rest of the panel. And hopefully if there's time for questions and conversation at the end, I'll see you again. But I'm very grateful to be here and excited to learn from all the panelists. So thank you for inviting me, Kevin and ASU. And I can't wait to see what other amazing ideas come up today. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um... Thank you so much. And I think we're about to talk about skill sets and mindsets that can help improve people's scores on those on those three um, mental states. Perhaps people, if they score themselves now, they might even find themselves a little higher on those scales at the end of this hour. Uh, maybe a fun little exercise to do. But uh, let's go ahead and kick off our panel. I will briefly uh, uh, introduce folks and then kick it off. So first off, Madeline, Madeline Ashby. The science fiction writer, futurist, speaker, teacher, and immigrant living in Toronto. She's worked with Intel, the Institute for the Future, Sci Futures, Nesta, Data and Society, the Atlantic Council, the Center for Science and Imagination, Go CSI, Changes, and many others. She is the author of the Machine Dynasty series, and her novel Company Town was a Canada Reads finalist. She's also a contributor to the book How to Future, Reading and Sense Making in an Age of Hyperchange, uh, with her colleague Scott Smith. 
Larry Popper is the founder and CEO of the aforementioned Sci Future, an award-winning foresight and innovation agency that uses sci-fi prototyping to help clients create meaningful change. Sci Futures has a network of over 300 sci-fi writers around the world and worked in a wide variety of industries with organizations like Visa, Hershey, Honda, NATO, JP Morgan Chase, and Coca-Cola. Sci-Fi Futures work has been featured in the BBC, Fast Company, Boston Globe, Wired Japan, CNBC, New Yorker, and CNET Magazine. A New Yorker piece is particularly interesting. Um, Stephen Weber is a professor at UC Berkeley and a partner at Breakwater Strategy where he focuses on the political economy of knowledge-intensive industries with special attention to IT, finance, healthcare, and global political economy issues relating to competitiveness. He's a frequent contributor to scholarly and public policy debates on international politics and US foreign policy. One of the world's most expert practitioners of scenario planning, uh, Steve has worked with more than 50 companies and organizations to develop this discipline as a strategy planning tool in for-profit, nonprofit, and government settings. And then finally, last but not least, is Leah Zaidi. Uh, she is the executive director of Multiverse Design uh, and is a strategic world building and foresight expert who's worked with prestigious organizations such as the UN, Stanford University, and a variety of Fortune 100 companies. Her research on strategic world building has won awards and is taught in universities around the world. We'll talk a bit about what she means by world building. As a strategist, she's tackled complex challenges such as the features of democracy, refugee crises, and the metaverse, and she is an advisor to the foresight divisions of Canada and Finland. So we've got a murderer's row of strategic foresight talent uh, in the house virtually, and so let's kick it off. Steve, I'm going to come to you with a very basic question. What are we talking about when we're talking about strategic foresight? Yeah, great question, Kevin. And listen, thanks for convening this panel. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be with this, folks. Um, I, 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 listen, I come to this from the perspective of having been a social scientist or kind of recovering social scientist, where I felt like my job was always to state a really crisp hypothesis and then try to prove how it was wrong. That was my job in the world. And strategic foresight, to my mind, is a kind of a flip of that logic to, as Jane said, use a kind of foresight optimism that allows you to look forward to what might be different and then press yourself to ask, what if it were three times more right than I ever could have imagined? What does that look like and how would I see that coming? What are the early signs? And look, I, I learned that to be honest from people who learned from the kind of progenitors of scenario thinking at Shell. Um, I just happened to move to Berkeley in 1990 and met a guy named Peter Schwartz who had come from the Global Business Environment Unit at Shell and started a company in the Bay Area to kind of take that scenario methodology out into the world beyond the energy sector. And the timing could not have been better because there was an immediate urgent need for that kind of thinking. It was called the World Wide Web. And so at GBN, we spent a decade, you know, we talked as we talked about ourselves as doing scenarios. What we were really doing was a form of strategic foresight, which did the following thing. And I'll end with this thought. Um, there were traditional companies that were facing a entirely new technology that just really felt to people like it could be transformative. And they didn't need to test hypotheses and falsify them. Falsify them. What they needed to do was in a kind of a disciplined, imaginative way, start to see different pictures of how their business, their relationship with their customers, their relationship with their suppliers, their relationship with data, how all that stuff could look different in this new thing called the World Wide Web, which nobody understood yet. And it was much more useful for us to imagine how it could be three times more different than basically the same. And it was much more interesting for us to emphasize the imagination part of that disciplined imagination and then walk that back to how would we know and what would we do? And to my mind, that's what strategic foresight is all about. It's about combining disciplined imagination with how would we know and what would we do? So I wanna tug on a thread there because I think a lot of people when they hear the word foresight or uh, dare I say futurism, 
um, they think that the job or the role is making predictions uh, and staking a claim on what is going to happen. But what you're saying is, it's really about coming up with a range of different possible futures, some of them more plausible and more like the status quo, and some of them wildly different from it, trying to get to the unimaginable stuff that Jane was talking about. So you can think about how to plan to maximize success regardless of which of those happens, recognizing that probably none of them actually has happened, but something in that piece of code of ability, name one of the tools that you guys use, um, is, is within is within that space. Is, is that would you say that's an accurate description of the of the of the goal? Yeah, I think that's right, Kevin. I mean, I think you know what we always try to think of is the landscape of the possibility space. And yeah, you know, you start by saying, look, I, I mean, knowing that I don't know, and acknowledging that in a really kind of profound, both intellectual and emotional way. Um, what would I do knowing that I don't know? It's all like, you know, the equivalent of sort of like acting behind the veil of ignorance. Now, you know, over time, I think what we've tried to do, um, partly because it's the right thing to do intellectually, but also because, look, real organizations that have to make big bets demand it, is to combine that kind of landscape thinking with, okay, over time, you know, signals emerge from the world about what direction the world is, is tending. And as we sort of absorb those signals in a thoughtful and prudent way, you know, we can start to make sort of feeling like, well, you know, it, it, all the stuff that we're seeing sort of things are moving in this direction. So let's like start to move away from a robust strategy, which says we really have, you know, we're no, I have no idea where on the landscape we're going to land. And let's start to adjust and sort of taper those bets a little bit so that we're testing the proposition that the world is actually moving in that direction. Now that's a far cry, you know, from what, 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 what some people will imagine, which is, okay, put a, give me three scenarios and put a probability on them. This one's 60%, this one's 20%, this one's 20%. Um, every time I see that, unless it's a, a very, very close in projection, in which case it's not really a, a, a scenario for strategic foresight, um, those probabilities tend to be, um, crutches that lead to a kind of false sense of precision, which leads to disappointment and disillusionment when it doesn't work. Because look, you know, we've, uh, uh, to go back to what Jane said at the beginning, we've just lived through a few years where very low probability events happen. The tails get fatter. You know, we say this all the time. So the fact that something is a 15% probability only means that it's going to happen 15 out of 100 times doesn't mean it won't happen tomorrow. Um, so as you described, and as James described, a lot of what we're talking about is the ability with a lot of research and qualitative and quantitative grounding to be imaginative about what could happen in the future, uh, in the future which is something that science fiction writers do as well, which explains, I guess, the existence of people like Madeline who is both a foresight professional and a sci-fi writer. So I want to turn to you, Madeline. Um, how do you see these fields and this creative work and the research that goes into it? How are they similar? How are they different? How do they feed on each other? Where would you start? Um, well, one, uh, also, thanks for, thanks for having me. Uh, and two, I would say that writing commercial science fiction for a broad audience for a main for a mainstream audience or for a for a audience that is already engaged in the act of reading for pleasure um is one thing where you can be as broad as possible and you can uh you can sort of write to your taste and to your audience's taste and explore things that are sort of on your wish list Right, you can explore your own obsessions and your own interests and your own ideas in a really in 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 as broad and deep a way as you like, right? Um, or at least start out that way. That can be the the beginning of the process. Writing writing about a very specific future in a in a writer to client context is the same as other work for hire arrangements that uh that other that some writers would know about it's the same as almost like writing for comics 
or film or television where there's an existing IP that you are then fulfilling, like you are then fulfilling the mission of, of that story. So the analogy that I frequently make uh, is that it's like being on Chopped. On Chopped, you, you are asked to put make dinner out of uh, a durian, marshmallow fluff, and beef jerky. Call it dinner. In this context, in, in the client work context for writing uh, futures-oriented stories, um, you are asked to make a story out of a technology and development, a demographic, a period of time, a location, and then perhaps more. You know, like it can go as fine-grained as you want. And so there's a great deal of precision that's required and a great deal of um, engagement with the with the ultimate audience and and sort of seeing what it is that they will respond to you you have to really get a sense very quickly like within the span of about you know a 15 minute 20 minute conversation about what the what that reader might be like and what how to meet them halfway as opposed to what is popular or what is, what is the artistic statement that I am trying to make? What is it that I am trying to say? The one thing, however, that they do have in common is that you have to be focused on what is it that I am trying to say? And if the audience or the reader or whomever walks away with one thing, what is it that I want them to walk away with? Because that's the central question of, you know, if you go to any writer's workshop, that will be the question that gets asked is like, what is it that you're trying to say here? And you and everything has to flow forward from that answer. Mm -hmm. And so just to clarify for the audience, what we're talking about right now is you writing short stories mm -hmm. that put in a narrative form the scenarios that have been developed about the future of the client or the product or the world that the client is going to be operating in. Can you talk a little bit more about how those two things interact and like, where do you come in in the process? <laughs> um, like. Uh, because, you know, we actually did a, uh, another panel on design fiction specifically, which is sort of the tail end part of the process you're talking about where you're writing the stories. But how does that interact with the scenarios part of the work? There are usually two points in which I can enter a project. One is sort of upstream during the research and framing phase during the during this what we would call the scanning phase where we're gathering a bunch of signals and trends and sort of maybe sorting them into the drivers that eventually frame those scenarios that like give us a world to play in and then maybe we sort of write a short story or or you know or a radio drama or a podcast or a short film or a comic book or what have you or a diegetic prototype that is set within you know those within those four scenarios or three or however many there are and then usually the job is to like push to the edges of those frames the other place that i am frequently called in to do uh some work is when that research has already been done and the people who did that research are very close to it and uh might be a little bit too close to it or they need a way to make that research come alive the thing about fiction is that it it makes ideas you know come to life that's the difference between a short story and a powerpoint presentation a powerpoint presentation is a list of is a point form list of ideas or trends or signals or what have you it's information and it can be very artfully pre presented i'm jealous of great powerpointers cuz i'm not one of them but the um but what fiction does is make those ideas sort of pop off the page, give them three dimensions. The analogy that I often make for it is it's like adding humans to a scale drawing. Without a little human in those, uh, in those sort of scale models, you actually kind of don't know how that building is supposed to work. You don't know how many people are supposed to be there. That's what I would say fiction does because its central role is to give people a view into humanity. And that's where it also aligns with other more traditional forms of, of art and, and fiction is that it's giving people a human lens on a given situation and giving them something to talk about, like a place to relate. Mm -hmm. Therefore, like it's the, the content of the story is not 
Bob from accounting being wrong or whatever, or you being right. It's a space in which we can have a conversation about poten many potential futures and the people who inhabit them uh, without uh, it being any one person's idea. Mm -hmm. So in terms of injecting humanity into the scenario, injecting the, the little tiny person, um, that's sort of what Psy Futures, our ETH company does as well, leveraging a network of hundreds of sci-fi writers. So a similar question uh, to you, Ari, how in your work does the scenario building and planning interact with and inform the design fiction side of your work and, and vice versa? What's, what's the pipeline look like there? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, also, I wanted to say thanks for having me. It's great to be here with this fa fantastic panel. Um, yeah, so um, exactly like uh, Madeline was saying, um, the purpose of story narrative and sci-fi and the way we use it is to help us overcome some significant barriers that organizations have. And these these are our clients are mostly Fortune 100s, although we do work with um, government organizations as well. But there are significant barriers to transformation, to change, and to like meaningful innovation. Um, particularly um, as Jane so beautifully set up for us in a time of like radical change, radical disruption, where all these unimaginable things are happening. How do we um, kind of prepare organizations to kind of rehearse the future as a term alike, it's been used before, to kind of anticipate these change and also to exercise and stretch their future literacy in their kind of imagination muscle. So um, science fiction is a very, very good tool to do that. But as Madeline was saying, it's not necessarily the sci-fi that you read when you go into your favorite bookshop. It's a very precise and unique type of science fiction that has to wrestle with constraints, um, just like the chopped analogy, um, in order to help us overcome the barriers that prevent organizations from changing. And so what are some of those barriers? Um, you know, organizations are risk averse. They don't like to change. Um, even though they know they have to. Um, there's a lot of inertia in companies. Um, there's a lot of corporate politics. Um, there's a lot of um, fear associated with um, um, people's jobs and livelihoods. Um, you know, there's the simple human stuff of just, will I look good in front of my boss? And will I please my boss? Um, you know, and that all is, rightly or wrongly, um, important variables that we need to consider when we're trying to transform organizations. But one of the most important component is um, making sure there's some kind of meaningful action that happens as the result of the work we do at Site Futures. Um, and I've always been incredibly biased towards action because the last thing that we want to do is to entertain people or just kind of create some fun. I mean, there's value in that, like team bonding and there's an education element in that. But really what we're trying to do is to create meaningful change. And what that means depends on the client, what they're trying to do, but it could be a new work stream, developing new products and services, changing their culture, um, having different policies um, that they can put into place related to disruptions like AI, things like that. Um, so um, what sci-fi does is it needs to be grounded in what we call the iron fist of all the really great strategic framework. So looking at all the signals, all the scanning work, the research that clients have that we do, let's take that material, use that as a foundational material. That's almost like the chopped. These are the ingredients. Where are the opportunity areas? And then what the narrative is, um, or the story is, is the velvet glove. So you've got the iron fist, which is that foundation, and then the velvet glove. And we all know the power of story. You know, we're storytelling creatures. Um, stories help us make meaning in the world. Um, they create um, belief systems about um, how things work, rightly or wrongly. Um, it's propaganda. So what we want to do is create this kind of optimistic, well-informed propaganda that moves an organization and gives them the sense to believe. So we want to create a visceral reaction to the future because emotion drives action. And I think where a lot of organizations get to and fail is they do excellent research and they, as Madeline was saying, they do excellent PowerPoint um, and the work is outstanding, but people aren't moved. Um, so we try to, to combine the two. 
Um, so story can be, um, it can be, as Madeline was saying, it can be short stories, there can be vignettes, there can be podcasts, and there's lots of different ways to create story. But the ultimate what we're trying to do is create an emotional connection with the future. You want to feel the future. Um, and that's what, for me at least, um, when I was reading science fiction, um, you know, I just absolutely loved losing myself. And but this is, it's a fantastic world. And so it's so unbelievable, but I feel like I'm there. I, I'm, I'm rooting for the characters. I'm in this crazy world. It, it, it's like I'm completely transported. That's what's that people who love sci-fi. That's the quality that they love. At least I think it's the fact that you're in this mm-hmm. other world. So we're trying to take that power and apply it to large organizations within all the constraints that I just kind of defined and set up. Um, it's not easy <laughs> work. It's very hard work. Um, and I think people go in this journey. We've been doing it for 10 years now. But for people who go in this journey, I think you can just write a science fiction story and hope your client will kind of invent the new and next best thing or change their culture. It doesn't work like that. It's a very consultative uh-huh. process. Um, you have to really work hard with them. You have to understand, you know, it's an emotional process. You go on a kind of hero's journey. Every project is a hero's journey of some sort. Um, yeah. So, so hopefully um, I've answered your question, but yeah, really, uh, so. okay, great. No, I'll stop. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting. You know, you talk about mm-hmm. the importance of instead of it just being a cool collection of stories, that your your goal is to prompt action. Yeah. Um, one interesting thing is, is how it's all the more important that it not just be a cool set of stories because it's also a set of stories that no one is ever going to see but your client. That's right. So, so yeah. if it doesn't have that impact, it's not like it's going to have any impact on any other audience. That's um, right. You know, uh, preacher Brian David Johnson has written a fun little piece about this corpus of secret sci-fi that's been slowly developing in the in the mm-hmm. vaults of the corporate and government worlds um, with an anecdote about Madeline that we'll probably come back to. Um, mm-hmm. But so before you get to the story, though, mm-hmm. you first need the scenario. You need to build the world yeah. uh, or rather the options of worlds, the various worlds that, that maybe the world your client is going to be operating in the future. So I want to turn to Leah. Um, so world building is also a, a key skill for science fiction writers, um, but uh, you are not a science fiction writer. You are a futurist. You are a strategic foresight professional. So could you talk about what world building in that context means and, and just more generally talk about the kinds of tools in the toolkit that that one would use to uh, come up with that scenario or build that world or worlds. Sure. Um, thanks for having me. So uh, world building, um, whether you're looking at stories or you're looking at foresight work, is essentially constructing a 3D landscape. So we're creating a future world and then we're thinking about what it means to occupy that world. Um, so if you want to use an example from fiction, Star Wars is a really good example of something that has a very robust world and you can tell many different stories. With Andor, we've finally gotten a version that isn't a Skywalker story and isn't a Jedi and Sith story. So we can kind of go into these different pockets of that world and look at like, what does it actually mean to be living within it? Um, Who's occupying it? What are the the day-to-day tensions that they're experiencing? What are the character arcs that they're experiencing? And so a really good world allows you to do just that, tell multiple stories within it. Um, On the foresight side of things, what we're doing is we're not necessarily creating, you know, worlds for entertainment or for enjoyment. We're creating these landscapes so that you can occupy them strategically. And so they're a little bit different than what you would see in literature. They're different than what you would necessarily see on screen. Um, The concept of creating scenarios comes out of script writing. So it takes that portion of the script that sets the scene and tells everybody else what to do, gives you kind of direction on where to go. And we take that and we translate that essentially into this, not quite a narrative, but this description of what it is that we want the client to sort of think about and occupy. And then the storytelling part comes in later where you think about the the strategy part and what you actually wanna uh, do in the world. And that's when you have the client occupy the world and think, okay, you're a character in this world. What does it mean to be in this world? What consequences for you? How do you behave differently? What do you do? And so we we kind of construct these worlds um, through various methods. Uh, For me in particular, because my practice is built on world building, I borrow a lot of what science fiction authors do uh, in the process of creating these worlds. So not necessarily the outcomes of what they're trying to create, but the ways in which they go about it. 
So I have a world building tool um, that looks at the seven fundamental aspects of any given world. And I make sure that every scenario accounts for all seven. Uh, when I do my research, I make sure that uh, all the research covers all seven, um, even if it seems like it's not relevant. So you might be wondering, you know, how does art apply to military? Oftentimes it does. <laughs> um, and we have to kind of consider it. And when we don't consider it, we miss fundamental things within the system that are key to uh, thinking about whatever problem or solution space that we're looking at. And then um, one of the other ways I kind of incorporate storytelling is through things like vignettes. So as Madeline mentioned, like stories that kind of accompany the work, the research, or the scenario. Um, that's often not work that clients want, unfortunately, even though it's the evocative work and it's the work that finally makes the abstract scenario really grounded uh, and actionable. Um, so in, in the event when I can't include the vignettes, which is often, um, I will include things like stakeholder uh, implications. Um, so in some cases, like when I'm building a scenario, it's not so much a scenario as a scene. Um, where I'm kind of setting up complex tension stakes um, and giving you a little hint of what the differing um, viewpoints in the space might be and kind of pitting them against each other. So if you want to look at an example of that, I have a scene up, up on my social media pages called Death Days, um, which talks about how similar to how we have a birth date, we might start selecting a date in which we leave the world. Um, and you can kind of get a sense of like what the different tensions that might play out if this were to, to take place. Um, and then uh, finally thinking about uh, world building in terms of how we do uh, strategy creation. So thinking more comprehensively about the landscape that emerges and how you have agency within that landscape and what you would do to sort of shift the world. So there's the work that we do in terms of like, how do you respond to the change that's happening? And then how do you actively create change? And what do you need to do to um, shift the world in a different direction? So that's kind of how it fits in. We have a question from the audience wondering what the seven components of world building that you use are. Yeah, um, okay, so it's the political, economic, philosophical, scientific and tech. Everybody looks at tech and forgets what the origins of tech are. It's usually science or art, which is uh, the sixth and then uh, the social. Um, so those seven in combination with each other, like I think about them from a first principles perspective. So politics isn't democracy. It's a system of governance that has rules, hierarchy, power associated with it. Uh, art isn't a painting, it's the aesthetics, um, it's expression and form. Um, so getting down to those first principles bits and then working up to see how do different things interact with each other, how might different signals play off against each other. Um, you know, if you have a world in which X exists, what else exists in that world? Um, that sort of building and churning of the world is really critical. It's one of the things that science fiction authors do really well that foresight practitioners don't do because in the process of creating a story and in the editing process, which is critical, you churn a world over and over again. And so those details start to feel more realistic and more coherent um, and they emerge and a author might not give you everything. They might not show you the entire iceberg that's kind of sitting underneath the water, but you have a sense that it's there. Um, and that's something that you kind of don't get a lot of in foresight work. Um. So you're saying that sometimes it's hard to get clients to actually want to pay for the additional storytelling or vignettes on top of the scenario work. Um, I wanted to layer on an additional challenge there. It seems like most of the time when they are willing to pay for that, um, <clears throat> it is it is with them as the protagonist or, or their product as the protagonist. Um, how do you maximize the impact of your stories um, despite maybe the desire or pressure for positive visions in these stories, even when um, it may be that like the most important thing they need to hear is the ways that things might go wrong, the ways their product may cause unintended negative externalities, et cetera, et cetera. Madeline, I'm curious for your take on this particular challenge. Um. Yeah, one, I really love being asked how things will go wrong. Like that is the favorite question that I can possibly be asked. 
Uh, I've worked in the past with Brian David Johnson, and and I remember the one of the first conversations we had. He sat across from me, and he's like, "I want you to tell me what the worst possible thing is with this." And I was like, "Great, let's go." Um, I was super excited, which isn't to say that I can't write about or don't want, wish to write about things being successful. I think that not planning for success is as detrimental as not planning for failure. But I think that in, especially in corporate environments, we don't uh, raise the possibility of failure. We don't raise the possibility of, of mistakes or things going wrong. Raising those issues might be perceived as being negative or not being a team player or uh, why are you always giving me problems? Why aren't you bringing me solutions? Like that kind of thing. And so it's very easy to default into a certain, you know, uh, style of thinking in which it becomes impossible to raise those possibilities. So one of the uses of, of all art, I would say, but uh, in particular, this kind of scenario fiction, uh, you can, which in French makes no sense, it's fiction fiction, but the, um, the, uh, the idea being that you can raise those possibilities without necessarily implicating, without, without sort of bringing on things that people might necessarily be terrified of or might get fired for or, or punished for. Because when you're the writer, you get to be the bad guy, you know, I, if I show up at your door, it's because you did something to bring me there. And the, um, the, uh, the idea being that I get to be the bad guy in that conversation for, for raising that thing. One of the things that you get to do then is if you feel pressure for the client to be the hero, um, and I have felt that pressure and I have gotten pushback on certain stories that I've pitched within the realm of the client scenario or within the realm of their research uh, with what they've established. Um, one of the things that I try to do if there is that pushback or they're just really not having it is to make it clear that in this world, things are still going wrong. We are still on the roller coaster. People are, you know, there is still suffering. People are still experiencing uh, difficulty. Uh, one of the stories that I wrote uh, like that was actually a story that I wrote for Ari uh, many years ago um, that. Uh, it was about an autonomous vehicle and, or the client was not autom autonomous vehicle builder. They were getting into that space or something like that. And so the, I think like the, the story that I wrote, and I re still really like this story a lot, is it was about someone using one of these vehicles, but she was using it because her mother had died and she needed to take an interstate drive. And she was so broken up over this death in the family that she didn't trust herself to operate her own vehicle. So this vehicle is like taking her on a physical and emotional journey where she's diving into you know, her own grief as she's going along and using it as an opportunity to like plan a funeral, write a eulogy, connect with family members, all those things, all the things that technically would be possible in this vehicle, but definitely not the usage that I think people immediately think of uh, when when they think of a car that drives for you or what have you. Like I I tend to think of I I tend to think about things that are bittersweet, in part because, and and I tend to think of of moments like that because my goal is often to represent a moment in life, even if it's in a future life, that the reader will have experienced or will experience. You know, losing a parent is an experience that all of us, if we have not had it already, will have. And, and wrestling with that and, and, and meeting that moment is something that across the board, whoever you are, you will have to deal with. And so I try to find the moment in time or the moment in somebody's life, the hinge point or the inflection point where, uh, where they can, where, where any reader anywhere almost could find, could find themselves in that story. And, 
and that's what I was trying to to do with that. And it's and it's often, you know, moments that are moments that give you pause. Can I can I just add something to that, Kevin? Sure. That, that's what I love about Madeline's work is that she's able to create a human connection with the future, and that's the secret sauce. I think that um, we're trying to get you. Quite, you don't get it every time because you don't want you don't want to write kind of an instruction manual way of saying they're like this is how people learn. And then I think like great writers like Madeline um, are able to preserve humanity, empathy, compassion, the qualities of being human, the negative, the positive, and then place it in the future contest and by doing that you get transported you, you immediately feel that sense of presence and viscerality that's the right word yeah. um and that's why um that's why sci-fi is in this context is very powerful well taking it back to the instruction manual part uh you know there's the sort of scenario and then the illustrative stories sort of you could say plot story um steve uh You've been around the block in this strategic foresight game. As you hinted at, there's a long history here, you know, from the Global Business Network in the 90s, going back to the strategic foresight team at Shell, going back to the strategic foresight team at RAND, going back to, well, World War II. Um, I'm curious, how do, you, how do you conceptualize, how does the field itself, as this field itself conceptualize its relationship in science fiction, because I gather it hasn't always been a necessarily happy relationship, or or uh, or one where where everyone's been comfortable with the association. Yeah, it's a complicated one, Kevin. And I think um, you know we hit some of the points um, earlier, particularly what Madeline was saying about this tendency of people naturally, um, without thinking, to kind of want to default to almost because of the association of the word scenario with worst case, best case. And of course, um, science fiction has often been associated with that too, in some people's minds. I and mean, people who don't do a lot of reading will typically think of, well, you know, there's this kind of dystopian and utopian science fiction genres. And of course, you know, the best fiction doesn't do that. It actually incorporates both the human element that Ari was talking about just now, but also that textural tension between um, the mix of things that might seem positive, it might seem negative, but even more interestingly, might seem really positive to one character and really horrible to another character. And I think it's in that kind of, you know, complexity that you start to see where Chin lies. And one of the ways that I, I've learned to think about that is, you know, from a very pragmatic standpoint, which I think works um, from a decision-making perspective too, is, when I think about a scenario that I'm trying to flesh out and understand, um, you notice the way I just said, I think about the scenario. The next thing I try to do is think to myself, who is a person and where are they situated? And that could be geographic, it could be socioeconomic, where, et cetera, where, that sees this same picture in a really interesting light that's different from mine. That could be more positive, more negative. It could be entirely like, who is that person who sees that picture a little bit sooner than me? What do they see and how do they see it differently and what do they do? And if I can then imagine almost like writing the story and the logic from their perspective, I've done something now which is really valuable for me, but I also I think for the decision maker that I might be trying to serve, which is like, stop trying to imagine that the rest of the world sees this future the way you see this future with a tiny twist on it. They see something very, very different. If you can put yourself in that situation, then it actually the, the, the whole point about future time doesn't matter at all. What matters is that you're seeing the world, the world from someone else's perspective. And I think that's from my, per, for, from my view, some of the most valuable stuff that happens when you combine those disciplines together. Um, I want to touch on you know, in our prep call, we mentioned, we talked about sometimes the risk of the association with sci-fi hurting the credibility of the foresight exercise or, or being um, unattractive to clients. Um, I, I, can you talk a bit more about, about that? I, I know that, that there have been some, some dust-ups around like futurism, you know, sci-fi involvement in futurism and whatnot. And, 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 you know, I know Ari said, 
when we were talking before, you know, he's had clients say, do what you do, but please don't call it sci-fi. <laughs> um, but so I'm wondering if you can comment on that tension. Yeah, I mean, I, everybody should weigh in on this. Um, my own experience is that uh, there was a greater, I mean, ironically, there was a greater appetite for conscious recognition of the fact that science fiction was a um, was an important resource in this in this battle to understand the, and and think about future action better. I think that um, that that appetite has declined a little bit, and not through the fault of the science fiction genre of science fiction writers, but actually weirdly because it's become connected to the more negative valence around technology generally in the last, I don't know, call it two to three years, but particularly now in the last year, and just sort of like really very mundanely connected to the collapse in the valuations of speculative technology stocks. So that like, to the extent that people have in their minds made, I think what is a simplistic and inappropriate, but still really common association. Science fiction is about technology. Technology is out of fashion. Wall Street hates technology. Users hate technology or are frustrated or annoyed or, or, or worried about it. And so by association, somehow scenario thinking that uses science fiction that depends on technology is tainted with that sort of bad smell or bad taste. And I think that's really unfortunate. And I think we'll probably get away from it because that bad taste and bad smell around technology isn't gonna last for much longer. So, so we've talked a bit about the challenges of getting clients into this work, into the, to pay for the scenario work itself or the illustrations of it through design fiction or artifacts or whatever. Um, I wanna put a, po a more positive valence on that question. Uh, Deji in Q&A says, can we see a pattern in terms of the people and institutions who do hire futurists and senior leaders, a single visionary at Skunk Works. And relatedly, at what moment does that happen? You know, Madeline, you said, if I'm at your door, you've done something wrong. Is that always the case? Is it, is it when they bump into a challenge already or when they're earlier in their journey? Um, maybe Ari, you could speak to this? Yeah, I think it um, depends on the client um, because it's such a versatile um, tool, you know. Um, it depends on you know you you can apply this to as leadership training you can apply it to like we've got this technology in r d and we don't know what to do with it you could apply it to um you know strategy it's just it's a very versatile um business tool at least for us um it's hard to say where the patterns are i will say that when i started the company 10 years ago i thought that i would be mostly working with foresight professionals um partnering with them um or being hired by um, corporations with a foresight function but it's actually been more i would say innovation in r d and maybe strategy who come to us uh, which is really interesting um kind of surprised me a bit um but over the years yeah it just it just um you know the power of of this work can be applied to so many different functions within an organization um yeah i mean it, it's it's not only that you have to also look at it who is, who is the client who's going to buy this sort of work? Well, firstly, um, they have to kind of really buy into the premise of storytelling and science fiction. Secondly, they have to be a bit of a maverick in their organization because they're going to have to basically pitch it and sell it in internally. Um, so they need some kind of support. You know, Thirdly, um, they're going to basically um, have to show some kind of ROI for that work. So like what kind of, you know, they can spend some money, considerable money what kind of ROI are they going to show for that um and so it's not like um you know unfortunately for I think for us as practitioners and for people in the space it's it's not something that is you know regular and repeatable it's something that happens occasionally for for pretty specific unique cases from pretty specific buyers um but I think maybe over time that may change um you know, I'd be interested to know the panel's point of view on that as well. Um, but generally, again, just with us, our clients um, generally come in, we do a very deep engagement, we work with them for quite a long time, and then they go away for a while. It's not kind of this repeatable work that just comes in all the, all the time. Um, Jane, I, I was wondering if you had a perspective on this question now that you're back. 
Mm, yeah. So I've been at the Institute for the Future for almost 20 years now. And something I'm seeing recently that I hadn't seen before that I think is really important to, to note is organizations coming to foresight work as a kind of therapeutic practice for the organization. So either their company has been involved in a situation where maybe there were unintended consequences or impacts of something they created, or their employees are feeling really um, burnt out from political events or social events. And there's a sense that it is good for the organization to do foresight work as a way to build hope for the future. And as a way, I mean, even to retain talent, to give people at all levels of the organization a sense that they have more of a voice in what the future of their work will be, and a way to, uh, I guess, basically heal from having lived through either the organization's own missteps or society's crises. And I think that is amazing because, you know, when you talk about ROI, how do you measure ROI of foresight work? People think, well, if you were right and you made more money because you knew it was coming, like that's a traditional ROI that's measured in long um, term studies. But you can also just measure things like, you know, as we talked about urgent optimism, uh, talent retention, you know, the um, the how employees rate an organization as being open to new ideas. Is this a place where you know, divergent thinking is welcomed. Um, and so even just changing the sort of culture um, of, of an organization is something you can do with this practice. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> well, I guess whether whether leveraging foresight as a, a strategic tool or therapy, um, especially during the last few years, it seems like that's something that not only companies and governments would benefit from, but but a whole bunch of other communities and types of organizations. So, so Leah, I'm going to give you the last word and ask you, how do you think about how can we broaden the use of these tools or change the tools themselves in a way that will make them usable by a, a broader set of communities and organizations so that it's not just companies and governments and militaries uh, that, that are using these tools? Sure. So um, I, I think one of the fundamental problems that we have in the field right now is that we've taken work that has been situated in a corporate history and has been designed for corporate use. Um, and we're kind of shoving it at people. Um, and so we're saying, you know, take these many hour long courses, spend thousands of dollars to learn this work. And that's not really equitable if you think about it critically, right? Um, who can take those courses? Who can um, spend the money, you know, to, to learn this skill? And so what we really need to do is instead of taking um, the work that is essentially, if, if we think about it in terms of like financial literacy, it's like the work of chartered accountants or wealth managers, um, taking this sort of systematic process and then thinking about what is the version that's actually useful to people um, and what's that look like? How do we create new processes, new heuristics, new methods um, that actually help people live a better life and think conscientiously about the collective future that we're creating? Um, so to me, democratizing doesn't look like taking everything that, that exists now and shoving it at people. It means rethinking the tools altogether um, and meeting people where they are. So that, that's a fundamental change, I think, that needs to happen. And an excellent note to end on, only one minute over time. So I want to thank all of you for being so generous with your time and your insight uh, today. Uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in. And of course, this video will also be archived uh, at the Center for Science and Imagination's website in a few days. So thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of the day.